Thank you so much and uh, thanks for, for having this wonderful uh, audience here despite of a foggy, chilly morning. Uh, so FinTech is something, you know, and of course, uh, before I can uh, proceed ahead, I thank my fellow panelists, Sanjeet, uh, Superno, and uh, Radha Raman, sir, from SIDBI. I think one of our uh, uh, fellow panelists is on the way, and we hope that she'll be uh, joining us shortly. But one thing which is important and which I would like to highlight is this, you know, FinTech is something which is uh, not just a buzzword anymore, it is a part of uh, everyday lives. All of, or at least most of us be, are using, you know, uh, FinTech for making payments, transfers, credit, savings, you know, um, by different names. So this is something which is very much part and parcel of our everyday uh, life. Um, I can still see some chairs, you know, empty in the front if, if you know, friends sitting in the on the back side, if they want to move ahead, uh, they are most welcome. But then nonetheless, you know, uh, to begin with, uh, to set a context, you know, uh, opportunities and challenges in, uh, in, in, in lending and especially with reference to the digitization is an important topic. Uh, now, uh, recently, I think few days back and I, early this week only, a governor, RBI was in Davos uh, and he was speaking uh, uh, at, a, at a function organized by CII and very, you know, positive kind of exposition of Indian economy and fintech uh, to be very uh, specific. And this is very important because a governor speaking about fintech and digital kind of initiatives in India in finance space, is, is they form a part of his speech at Davos. It speaks about itself. Now, uh, the way uh, NBFCs have been growing, non-banks have been growing their role and digitization, particularly digitization in currency, uh, central bank digital currencies, UPI, digital lending, different alternate lending models which have emerged, use of alternate, uh, you know, data sources, AI and ML technologies. And recently, you know, I'm just, you know, sharing because, you know, all of us may be at different levels in, in terms of, you know, uh, okay, so I thought Pallavi is there, <laughs> anyways. So, but you know, the point is this. Uh, and then there are different kind of streams there. There are, you know, like personal uh, consum consumer loans, there are loans to MSMEs, there are loans for new emerging, you know, uh, digital kind of uh, services for emerging themes like electronic vehicles, EVs. <laughs> ad tech, healthcare services, and so on and so forth. And digitization has revolutionized all these things. The role of public policy and the policy makers role is, is very important here. The regulatory role is very important and they have been very appreciative and supportive of agenda of financial inclusion and digital financial inclusion in particular. Uh, with the real, uh, recently we saw advanced estimates for economy which were released by uh, National Statistical Organization for H1 and which pegged in growth of, uh, you know, um, economy at 7.3 percent, which is a 1 percent and many analysts, by the way, say that, you know, they are surprised by the growth and especially coming on the fintech side, growth is important because it is in this context in which we see growth of digitization, digital lending, fintechs in this country. So I'll uh, just pause here and to begin with the first question, I think I sh should go to uh, probably Sanjeet. Uh, so there's a one common question and that is, you know, we'd like to understand what are, you know, broad challenges and opportunities uh, in fintech and, and through digitization which is happening in financial inclusion space. How do you see it from the perspective of, you know, uh, you, you had a, India as perhaps the largest credit bureau. So how do you see that? A lot of data, you know, flows through your organization. So over right. to you, Sanjeev. So I, I think fintech's the biggest uh, challenge was, uh, you know, first of all, uh, putting in people's mind that, you know, fintech can do a better job than maybe a normal NBFC or bank can do. So I think we are over with that. I think in the last three years we see uh, fintechs have grown to the extent that today there are very, very uh, large contributors, right? The challenges that I think fintechs have today is to, uh, see fintechs have been focusing on numbers, fintechs have been focusing on, uh, you know, growing the volumes, 
uh, obviously the fintechs have been able to get into areas where normal NBFCs banks were not there. So uh, yes, financial inclusion has happened. Uh, we've grown at maybe 30, 30 percent plus in terms of uh, you know consumer lending, which we were talking about. The biggest challenge today is to you know now look at the quality, the asset quality, and the customer profile. Uh, because as we grow and as you go deeper in, uh, you know the thought was that uh, the delinquencies are there in the larger cities. Uh, you go into the smaller cities, the delinquencies are going to be lesser, or uh, they will not be there. But I think that's not what is happening. So I think the biggest challenge for fintechs today, other than obviously capital uh, and and the other things, is uh, now to start focusing on the quality of asset and to look at uh, the customer acquisition uh, in the correct uh, form. So I think that will be the biggest challenge I think I foresee going forward for the fintechs. Yeah, <coughs> firstly, uh, uh, very good afternoon. Uh, again, thank you for having me here. Just to add on to the perspective, uh, I'll try to keep it simple in terms of the, opportun like the opportunities or the good things which fintech is doing. Uh, the consideration is of typically three A's. Uh, if you see, if if you take fintech out of the equation, there will be a hit on affordability, there will be a hit on accessibility and availability. And that's what fintech is doing. Very, very, to keep it in very simple words. When I say like in terms of aff affordability, fintech has substantially reduced the cost of service. We talk about India as a large country, total addressable market and all that. But the test of the pudding is like, is the market serviceable? And to push the horizon of serviceability, you need technology and you need end-to-end -end digitization. And that's what FinTech is doing. So that's the affordability part. Second is in terms of the access accessibility. If you talk about FinTech and if you talk about the remotest part of India, today we are in a situation, even if the company which I am representing, that we are servicing, let's say, 95% plus PIN codes. So for a company, uh, for a country of this spread and size, to be able to kind of actually get the service to the fingertips, that's a big, big difference. The third part is, as I mentioned, is in terms of the availability. That means which kind of products, which kind of services, and the availability around round the clock 24 by 7. We are talking about, uh, Jitendra mentioned about the payments part of it. It's like around the clock. And if you're even talking about other services, which has a scale aspect of both scale and depth, for example, a service around brokerage solution, a service around lending. There also the instantaneous nat nature of it actually opens up the opportunity where things are non-discretionary. Even things where, let's say, you have to, there are people possibly not so on the fortunate scale and they have to have access to credit even to save the life of a family member. So the instantaneous nature in terms of the availability also makes a difference. So fundamentally, these are the three things in terms of what FinTech is doing good and the opportunities affordability, accessibility, and as I said, like you know, if you can make it available. The other part, the challenge, I will just add on at that aspect. As of now, FinTech and Tech has been only in the last mile. It's only in the last mile where we have been able to solve the problem. But if you have to take it to the next level, the entire value chain has to kind of leverage that aspect of technology, digitization, and fintech to a large extent. So we are talking about supply, we are talking about supply and retailer co collaboration, and then it's about the last mile. So a bit of a challenge and opportunity is for sure there. Uh, there is an aspect of funding in terms of how the capitalization of fintech is also going to happen. From there, a uh, little bit of a rewiring and double-clicking also is required. The way possibly we have viewed fintech till maybe 2021, early 2022, and now what it is, there is a rewiring possibility is required, and that's what the challenge is as well. So I'll pause there. Thanks, Supernu. Maybe, sir, uh, your perspective on challenges and opportunities that digitization brings in, you know, financial inclusion and fintechs in particular, and then we'll move to our next question. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks for having me here in the first place. See, uh, for us, financial inclusion has always been part of our existence. Uh, for instance, we cater to the MSME segment. Uh, SIPBI caters to MSME. So uh, you start with very... Uh, maybe you want to put it a little closer, I think. The yeah. Is it audible? Yeah. So for us, micro, small and medium enterprise is the bread and butter. So small and medium enterprises don't need much hand-holding, but micro has always been a challenge. Uh, but we have been able to grow over the years. Uh, like for instance, I still remember in our first year, 
91, when the bank was set up, we ended with a portfolio book of 5,000 crores. Now in all these years, we have something like, uh, let's say, 4 lakh crores. So the growth has been substantial, uh, despite the manpower remaining the same. So I think all, the, all of you in the management will understand how the manpower is uh, put to task. Uh, that apart, the growth also happened because we focused on financial inclusion at a much earlier stage, when everything was physical. Uh, we have managed to bring in certain systems, certain processes in terms of engaging with partners across the country, microfinance institutions, NBFCs, and catering to a segment which was outside the regular banking segment. And that we see now happening is going to happen on a much larger scale at a much faster pace because with the advancement of fintech, we see there is tremendous scope for us in accessing those sections, like one of the panelists said that, who are not easily accessible, who are outside the regular banking sector in remote areas. With fintech, that's become easily accessible for us, number one. Two, the speed of turnaround is increasing substantially. Even within the bank today, for instance, 10 years back if you had come, it would have taken a certain amount of time to give a ma machine loan. Today, if you come to any of our branches, uh, one of my colleagues was telling me, sir, within 30 minutes, I'll give you a sanction. When I was talking to one of my juniors, he told me, sir, within 30 minutes, I'll give you a sanction. And if you give all the details and documents, and, uh, and if you get your banking clearance, everything in place, end of the day, I'll release the disbursement to you. So we have realized the importance of fintech and are trying to bring it into our financial inclusion work. Thank you so much, uh, sir. So, you know, to begin with, you from that and, uh, you know, uh, don't leave your <laughs> mic. So I think, you know, uh, you very rightly pointed out, you know, MSMEs, SMEs, you know, are bread and butter and when it comes to the micro piece, actually the micro is somewhere where there's a challenge, the last mile challenge which we say. And SIDBI has been a stellar organization, uh, All India Financial Institution, which has been supporting cause of financial inclusion uh, in India. And the wonders which uh, SIDBI has done with the microfinance sector is, uh, is, is commendable. And now next wave, uh, and, and of, of course, you know, that's an, uh, that is out in media as well as SIDBI is a new fintech now. And uh, the kind of support it, uh, you know, provides to fintech entities. And MSMEs being, you know, very crucial for exports, for job creation as per, you know, uh, recent data which has come up uh, from the uh, uh, Udyam uh, portal about there are 3.16 crores of uh, MSME units in this country providing jobs to about uh, 12 crore uh, population. Uh, and then the contribution in terms of gross value in, in uh, GDP is around 29% uh, for the last year. And of course, export, it contributes about 43%, which means that you can't ignore MSMEs. And the role which fintechs play is indispensable there. There are good number of fintechs now, and also the members of DLAI, uh, you know, which, you know, contribute heavily on this side. Now, SIDBI being, uh, you know, uh, the harbinger of small business uh, access to credit, in terms of wholesale through different, you know, uh, channels and digital being the dominant now. So, uh, what are some of the latest initiatives of, you know, SIDBI? As we understand, there's a lot going around, around, you know, uh, un, uh, this uh, uh, in, uh, formalization of informal, you know, uh, Udyam, uh, Udyam uh, you know, units and then having Udyam certificates, then Prayas is there, GST Sahai kind of developments are there. So what are the new developments? Because inside this room and through this public, you know, platforms like this, there are policy discourses and, you know, the discussions, you know, move. So what are, you know, some of the key initiatives which SIDBI is, you know, keeping as its priority for uh, digital uh, sector, for fintech sector? So can you share a little bit about, you know, the initiatives uh, which this, uh, SIDBI has. Sure. Uh, thanks for the kind words, but we also exist because of the entire ecosystem. See, we require somebody like a credit bureau. Sanjeev sir needs to give us the data to work on certain things. We require the fintechs. Again, the, you know, Mr. Bakshi has to provide us the support there. We take substantial support from DLAI, various fintechs. 
that's how we operate. But broadly, if you have to put it, I'll put it in three baskets. Uh, the first is, you know, uh, whenever we start working, typically it happens to be slow. Like an elephant takes time to get up, you know, start, you know, walking around, strolling, then it gets, in, gets into a run. So we are something like an elephant, we should admit. But if I have to put it in three baskets, first what happens is we do a pilot. So typically in pilots, everything is open. So we have a fintech uh, policy and engagement policy where we say, okay, we can engage anybody up to a certain quantum of, uh, you know, this thing. We have provided a fund for that. We engage with fintechs. It's an open-ended platform. You come with an idea, we'll see what is feasible there and we try to implement that. So the rails are pretty open there. We don't get into drawing the border lines at that point of time. And since we are a financial institution, we look at, uh, you know, directly when we're engaging, how best we can use this for lending to MSMEs, micro enterprises primarily. The second stage, the second basket is when we have finished the first one. I have piloted it. Now it's good to go. I know the structure, how the skeleton is behaving, how the architecture is behaving. So I try to define the boundaries. I try to define the entire architecture, how this product will behave, who it will cater to, to what extent. And we put that and run it on a scale. For instance, something like Prayas, we started. Uh, you know, like MFIs sometime back came to us and said, some, there was a demand from some MFIs that, see, we can't keep on uh, scaling up our portfolio because of capital requirements. Uh, the second one was that some of the bor borrowers are growing out of their existing size and they're not able to cater to them. So we said, okay, we'll make use of your ecosystem. Let the MFI act as a partner. We will provide the lend direct lending to them. So we have a simple app there. Uh, the uh, MFI has the feet on ground. We make use of it and we lend directly to the individuals up to 5 lakhs, which MFIs do not. So we're not competing with our partners. We are providing add-on services and we're able to reach to a segment which is outside otherwise the formal financial uh, reach. And when we started, it was in the first basket. Now it's in the second basket. Like uh, last nine months, we must have grown the portfolio by about 50-60% already. Uh, so it's already at 2,000 crores and we see a substantial business happening in that segment. Uh, the third basket, for instance, we have something called GST Sahai. Here again, we started piloting it. It is still in the first basket phase where we have developed the rails. You make use of uh, the uh, two, three protocols, GST returns, IT returns, and the bank statement of uh, the individuals make an assessment. Based on that, we set a limit for them. So once an, an enterprise comes to the app, uploads their invoice, uh, we set a limit on that invoice and say, okay, this can be dispersed against this. This much amount can be released against it. Now, from that was the first phase, and now we have opened a system where we said that, okay, if you are this good, we give you a limit of, say, 10 lakhs or 15 lakhs or up to 20 lakhs. And within that, you upload your invoices and keep on, on a cycle, go on it. So it's kind of a working capital facility that's being opened. Uh, the fintech engagement is in ensuring that, you know, your end use is verified, invoice uh, financing is happening, so end use is. The third basket typically is where it's an ecosystem intervention. Uh, we don't necessarily take it to lending structure. But to see how can we can bring the MSMEs into a more formalized state. For instance, when we uh, started some work some time back, uh, we realized that you have about uh, seven, eight crore enterprise in this country or even much larger number. But only a few, about a crore or so are registered on the Udyam uh, platform of ministry. So we developed a kind of a different digital platform where we said all these informal mic micro enterprises, which are nowhere in the picture, we have found ways to bring them on uh, the platform using, you know, fintechs and regulated entities and giving them valid business IDs. So right now we have some, done something like 1.2 crore in the last uh, three months and we expect to reach something like 5 to 6 crore in the coming months. So this is the kind of approach that we keep. One is ecosystem level, two, a pilot stage, and three, getting into mainstream business of the product. Thank you so much. Uh uh, for sharing this detailed perspective. I think let's move to the another part of, uh, uh, you know, fintech lending and which is, you know, uh, consumption or consumer lending. 
so Suparno, uh, the question comes to you because you are one of the leading uh, platforms in the country which is into, uh, you know, retail loans, consumer loans, BNPLs and, and other kinds of loans. So, <coughs> recently, uh, I think last month, CFRL, CAFRAL, came up with a report, All India Finance Report, which talks about some good things about, you know, consumer loans. And uh, there is also, you know, RBI has slightly nudged uh, different NBFCs and banks. So, this is kind of a mixed question to uh, you, Sanjeet, and uh, you, Suparno. So, from a practitioner's perspective, you know, the impact of uh, con consumption, <coughs> sorry, household consumption, uh, you know, we did a study with Ernst & Young and it came out that household consumption is something which is going to, uh, you know, drive fun uh, consumer finance in this country and it also contributes about between a range of 60 to 63 percent of uh, GDP, that's one piece. And large part of that is financed through, you know, different uh, formal financial institutions. And the impact, consumption impact of loans issued by fintech is higher than public sector bank. That's what CAFRAL report says. Now, RBI has also come up with, you know, a kind of a nudge to different uh, banks and NBFCs, uh, kind of slowing down uh, lending into this uh, segment by increasing the risk weights. Recently, when RBI governor was speaking at one of the leading conferences, he kind of uh, mentioned, you know, although situation is not that alarming, it was a preemptive pre steps and then asset quality is, you know, healthy, but as a preemptive step, they have taken this uh, kind of a decision. Of course, after this panel, we are also going to release a report on consumer finance, which we have, DLA has, you know, jointly worked with the uh, CRIF Highmark. India's leading uh, credit bureau, you know, uh, credit information company, which is also, which talks a lot about the lines on which we are talking and governor also spoke. So now my question to you is this. So as a practitioner, how do you see this? Because you are partnering with different, uh, different funding partners, which are NBFCs, banks. So what has been, you know, your experience since this announcement was made? Has pricing gone up? Has more screening filters come up? Or is it, is it impacting, you know, uh, financial inclusion because less number of people coming up, you know, for loans? So what is the impact uh, like? Sure. So uh, first thing, just touching upon a little more on the consumer side of it, what you mentioned. So what's driving this demand? It's driving on two scales. One is as a country which we are growing and therefore that has its own macro expectations in terms of the consumer and access to consumer and access to credit. So uh, at a very, very fundamental level, I'll give my own example. Um, I could do my master's because I had access to student loan. Uh, my quality of life got positively impacted because I could get access to a car loan and a home loan. The fact of life is 80% of our country is not that fortunate. So the way it impacts in terms of the basic quality of life and how you want to address access to credit is, credit is of paramount importance. The other aspect why what is driving the consumer part of it is also the behavior in the sense like by and large even at an individual level if you see there is an inflow and then there is an outflow. Over the years, I'm not talking about the capitalization, I'm not talking about the GDP only, I'm not talking about the income growth. But over the years, if you see the frequency in terms of the input has by and large at a retail level still been a monthly salary. So we are talking about an inflow which is still constant at a monthly level. But what has happened in terms of the consumer behavior and accessibility to different, um, let's say consumer goods or how you want to do, the frequency has totally changed. When I grew up, possibly I got a like a new pair of shirts maybe during Diwali or during my birthday. Today it is very different. I'm not talking about just the number of shirts which maybe people are buying or the, you're buying for your kids. But the frequency has changed. So even if you look at good consumer credit, one is the overall expansion and another is the gap between your inflow and how you are spending. And, that there, and that's the place a good consumer credit comes into play and the growth is happening. The reason I'm calling that out is like if you keep it in simple terms, this market and the demand is actually a very qualified and good demand. Now the other side of it, the point which you made, 
the nudge from the regulators or maybe in some ways a bit of an apprehension which is coming in. The way I'll put it, I'll give an analogy of when you see a very, very high speeding car. Maybe the car is not violating any rules, maybe all the traffic lights the car is maintaining, but if you see a high speed car and if you r really don't know who is driving the car, there will be a level of apprehension. The hyper growth has resulted into a level of apprehension, that's for sure. Now if you double click around it, there is a bit of rationale also, I will have to accept being part of the ecosystem. And the rationale also has been the long tail of the number of players and the rationale also has been that in some cases possibly we were missing out on the fundamentals of the business. If I comment on lending only the fundamentals of business in terms of how we are doing underwriting, whether we are doing it in with the right kind of contours. So the way I look at it, we are not, we have not yet reached the stage of equilibrium. There has been a case where the consumer demand has been appropriately tapped but there is also a situation by doing that and given the pace of growth possibly we have an opportunity to actually see who are the material players and whether they are acting responsibly and whether we are not missing out on the first principles. And that's where the nudge is helpful and that's where even if you see in terms of impact is it only on the cost of capital? The answer lies between yes and maybe but the more important thing is if the first principles are taken care of, if the quality of the portfolio are taken care of, given the kind of demand, given the kind of market, uh, there I don't foresee any near term or even for sure no longer term impact in terms of the liquidity coming into this ecosystem. So that's the way I'll put it. In summary, we are a little far off from a stage of equilibrium. So for all of us have to be maybe operate in that mindset of being a responsible lender and we should be there. No, I think that's great, you know, you touched uh, a very indispensable point which is responsible lending. So before we move to the next question and I think we have a next five, seven minutes remaining but I move to Sanjeev to you. So what yeah. does data tell us Sanjeev about this? <laughs> You're putting me in a difficult situation. Maybe so you can preempt some of the findings which we have in the report. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I think, you know, uh, somewhere I think you uh, made a life a little easier talking about responsible lending. Uh, like you rightly said, I mean the car's speeding uh, and who's sitting in the car, who's driving the car, uh, specifically if it's a, it's a car which is a driverless car, uh, I think you become a little more uh, susceptible to, you know, thinking that, you know, there might be an accident. So, uh, I think there was a growth which was happening, uh, uh, growth driven by fintechs, uh, growth even driven by NBFCs and banks uh, and driven, you know, a lot of these loans were being driven by scorecards. I think if you if you hear what the RBI had to say, I think uh, there was, I mean, I, I will not call it the fact that, you know, we guys are a little uh, dated in our mind, but I think the fact was that who was driving it? Was the uh, algorithms which were working on it good? Uh, was it having the impact that it should have? I think those were the questions which were getting asked. So, uh, I think what has happened is and what will happen going forward is that uh, fintechs have done a wonderful job in terms of uh, going to the, uh, I'll call it Bharat, which is the smaller cities, uh, uh, giving loans to people, like you said, microfinance institutes, uh, personal loans and all, to people who uh, were not getting loans. Uh, if you talk about an NBFC or a bank, you needed a person to be there. Fintechs made it so easy for a person to just avail a loan by clicking of a button, right? So, so that growth happened, but I think what will happen now is it will be what we call responsible lending where uh, I think algorithms or whatever will work will become more and more sensible. So my thought is like what you're saying rightly I think uh, that equilibrium is going to happen because uh, it might have slowed down as of now because uh, you know suddenly when something changes uh, you know if, if, even if it's a car which is automated car and you realize there's something wrong then you need to correct it something will change something will slow down but uh, the demand being there and you are right, the generation which is there doesn't want to wait today. Uh, I think our parents or parents ahead of that used to wait, save and go and take a loan. Today when you walk into a consumer durable store and you like something, you just want to pick it up, right? So, so I think what will happen uh, in the next few months and I think uh, if you look at the data also when we release the report, you'll see, uh, I don't think it's going to slow down the, it, it'll slow down the growth but the growth will remain because the market is still buoyant, the market is growing, the demand is there. Uh, and today a guy sitting in a remote village wants the same thing which a guy sitting in the city wants, right? So I, I think 
with fintechs providing that opportunity, with uh, people like Sidbi supporting the MSMEs, uh, the jobs will get created, the market will grow, with government pushing all the initiatives that they are. I, I think it's going to be a win-win for everybody. But yes, uh, we will need to be careful on how we go ahead. Thank you. So thanks. Uh, before we, you know, uh, move to the Q&A part because there are, you know, very patiently waiting uh, audience and they have been listening as you have been a great audience I must appreciate. Uh, but before we move to the audience piece, I think the final uh, thing maybe Sanjeet we can start with you and Supernu and sir we'll uh, come to you. So like you know you rightly said your growth is going to be there and fintechs are you know making a great difference. So what are the dominant trends probably in next uh, 18 to 24 months? which you see, you know, based on your uh, uh, interface of data and with the industry. So what are the dom two, three dominant trends which you see, you know, happening in digital lending or in fintech in this country? See, like I said, I, I think uh, the biggest uh, trend is, I mean, though there is a slowdown, I, I think that the growth will continue. So the growth story of India will continue. Like you said, 7.3% is somebody is estimated. I think uh, that's correct. I think India is on the way to becoming a trillion dollar economy. Um, there, there is a growth, there's a push on the MSME. Uh, I think today, rather than, you know, uh, us looking at the government providing jobs, I think it's the MSME which is going to provide jobs. So, I think MSME is a clear growth story. Uh, consumption growth is also a clear growth story. Though it might not be a 30% plus the way it is going, it will slow down. Uh, so, I, I mean, if you ask me, I think it's a good growth story for us. Uh, there will be a balanced growth going forward. Uh, maybe a little muted, a little slowed. But it will remain and I, I think with more fintechs coming into the foray, uh, you might have, you know, a little shakeout uh, in the fintechs. So some fintechs will go out or get taken over. But I think even if I look at the larger banks, they are trying to become fintechs. You know, like you said, Sidvi is a fintech. You know, so that mindset uh, which was not there today is there. I mean, you want to do it, make it easier. Uh, you want to cut down and like you rightly said, I think the front end has got automated, the back end still needs to get automated. So, I think that full on fintech is something which we will see going forward uh, with more AI and ML uh, coming into play. So, I, I think it's a good time ahead. I think we should, uh, you know, not get bogged down by the fact that the policy is coming because I think RBI is one of those good regulators. Whatever it does in time, we see good positive impact on that. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Supan, over to you. Yeah, I think uh, one key word for the next two to three years, it would be depth. In the sense like we have done a good job in terms of scale and like solving the last mile reachability, accessibility. Uh, and we have a lever around scale which will take care of it for the next two to three years for sure. Now the question when I say depth, what that means, double clicking a little, it means like uh, the last mile underwriting also see a very different kind of a deep on leverages of technologies. We talk about AIML, uh, it'll go deep in the sense like we will see uh, already alternate is mainstream, but we will see like how more it gets into that aspect. We will see also depth in terms of origination. Uh, digital origination by and large through all these years have been by and large banked upon universal campaigns. Uh, many of you in the field would know. But from here to there in the next two to three years, it would be also making sure how the digital origination goes a lot more deeper in nature. Again, the frontier technologies like AI, ML will be a key, uh, play would play a key role to it. So for sure, depth is going to be the keyword and you will therefore see that for one consumer from a fintech, and I'm not just limiting as just from the lending side of thing, for a fintech you will see there are multiple services coming to one consumer. We will know, know your customer to a very, very different degree. We will exactly possibly be able to cater to multiple services at a first degree personalization. Today first degree personalization has happened for lending, right? When someone is a borrower, we know whether to he or she needs to be underwritten, we know the ticket size, we know the price point, everything has happened at a Uberization level. That level of depth of first degree personalization we'll see across FinTech possibly in the next two to three years. Yeah. Thanks, Supano. Sir, over to you. Uh, so, yeah. So, uh, two things uh, we see. Uh, one is on the lending side. It will make it much more easier for the customer to access the service wherever it's required and it makes it much more faster and a bit of a challenge for the lender in terms of competition but uh, operationally reduces the cost for the lender. 
the second that we see is that you know the government is quite keen on bringing out changes in the policy front during the interactions it's very clear that they want to increase the pace of reform so the one area that we look at is the self regulatory organization that rbi is talking of once they come with it i think that's going to strengthen the fintech ecosystem and uh, push the entire uh, you know uh, uh, the landscape uh, or the digital scape forward that i think would be the uh, would be a big uh, change statement in the coming future thank you so much uh, it was wonderful to have this discussion and you know clear uh, you know trends are like msme is going to lead there has been there is going to be a substantial a role of consumer finance there may be little here and there shake ups in fintech because that's a growing industry and that you know is a part of uh, story then debt is another piece digital originations uh, superno you kind of highlighted use of ai and ml technologies and responsible uh, you know um, ai that's what being uh, talked about and uh, the meti the ministry of information electronics and it is doing a great work on this on developing that ai ecosystem in country the different contours of that and then of course sir as you you shared accessibility and speed and the kind of public policy support policy support for fintechs uh, be with, with these you know kind of trends in place i think it's going to be great optimism in this space and there are, mul there are many 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 more positive things uh, which for the you know for the want of time we cannot discuss here uh, over to you know uh, some if you have some, if i guess we still have some 5 7 minutes maybe to the audience if they want to uh, you know contribute to the discussion so i would urge please identify your, yourself and be specific with your question so that you know uh, we can uh, share our experiences with you on that question any questions from the audiences yes please can someone hand over the microphone to the lady in the second row kindly identify yourself and also let us know who this question is for a very bright afternoon sir i belong from the chitkara university and i'm currently pursuing bba in financial technology so uh, my question uh, is that in your opinion like uh, what role does artificial intelligence plays in the future of digital learning and what are the key trends in this changing phase of digital learning maybe uh, i'll take the question see it's a heart of it right you would have heard articulations like ai is like the electricity so you want to run a business you need elect like you run to run this infrastructure you need electricity for please have a seat yeah so you need uh, artif so ai is going to be at the core of it uh, how it is going to where it is going to come by basically in decision making right so wherever across the value chain you see there is an opportunity for decision making you would want to kind of get ai into place and it will take a huge huge role primarily if you see there have been two three stages how, how tech and fintech has evolved we have been focused on a very vertical manner in the sense like hey you know someone is doing wealth tech okay what's the recommendation in terms of the portfolio rebalancing put an ai model around that someone is doing lending you focus on like underwriting put an ai model around it now we are coming out of that phase we are coming to that phase where you will see across the value chain there will be use cases which will be fueled by ai so be it be origination underwriting be it be things around even in lending business collections if you see collections is a huge opportunity still uh, it's a lot more rules and heuristics driven and with the hustle of operations there's a huge opportunity how ai can coming in terms of decision making having said all good things about ai we also need to understand the limitations of ai the first and most important limitation of ai as we speak i'm not talking about the computing power and cost of it that will anyways go down further but as a design its limitation it's it's always retrospective let's face it it can only look at the data on a historical basis and then try its best in terms of projections 
but that is not the way possibly the best outcome will be wherever we implement ai and as i mentioned it will be across points function points of the value chain wherever we implement ai it has to be complemented by heuristics so that we know there are safeguarding happening from a prospective basis black swan were events like covid and all we cannot be crystal balling always but let's face it it has to be a combination of both that's where the aspect of responsibility will come in people will talk and expect a lot more around explainability of ai as well in the sense it cannot afford to be a black box we have seen even footprints of it when the regulator mentioned in digital lending guideline in terms of phase 3 and all it's a clear placement is there that explainability explainability also has to be there so that we know we are responsible but 100% explainability cannot be achieved so that's the reason i'm calling it out with all the good usage of ai it has to be ai plus heuristics come into play because domain is of paramount in terms of the knowledge and the wisdom so i'll pause there if anyone wants to as add on uh, i have a question for you so i am piyush i am the founder of inclusive fintech hub could you please okay sorry no, thank you uh, i am piyush i am the founder of inclusive fintech hub so my question is that ai gives you the capability to judge the capacity to repay a loan right so i just want to understand how the digital lenders are trying to identify the willingness to repay the loan as well are there any data points on that point on on those parameter as well or because ai can only give you what has happened in the past and what you can predict that is more like a capacity but how do you measure the willingness to repay of a and kind of a moral hazards that you find in the industry itself uh, i'm so sorry maybe i'll take the question or yeah, yeah do you take it because you are the practitioner <laughs> so <laughs> the point is probably is referring to the underwriting piece of that right so um see uh, as i said earlier for us alternate when you talk about ai and on alternate it mainstream and what that means is when you look at a traditional view and traditional data point which all due respect it's all rule based now what's happening is in a way rule based also some of the data points you look at history right when you look at your bureau score also you are looking at actually history you are not projecting anything so that way machine learning i will not totally say ai machine learning has the edge because you are trying to prospect based on certain models etc when it comes to the lending behavior of it actually ml is a lot more powerful that way because you are draw, able to draw inferences and commentary not just based on let's say uh, the income disposable income the consumer behavior part of it but you are also able to do it in alternate basis so there are two parts to it right one is alternate data and you create models another is like the alternate uh, behaviors and the modules i'll give you an example maybe when if you're into lending in a traditional credit uh, view you don't have the visibility of like okay is there someone into too much into gaming and gambling but when it comes to the digital world you might have a view point is it like a causality maybe maybe not but the kind of data you have ai will give you that kind of a confidence that even if it's an aspect of correlation whether something can be considered as a form of causality so to answer the question and you mentioned about moral hazards that's where again ai is going to be very very helpful because some aspects of moral hazards which are typically outside the domain of a traditional viewpoint ai will help you to build those models it also applies to fraud analytics and how you even prevent fraud yeah uh, i have a question sorry uh, right here just to uh, just to counter your point uh, slice started with ppi based cards right which the rbi discontinued so uh, do you think the regulatory bodies will allow something uh, like ppi or something like models that are based on anything except for your credit score so uh, that is one question and the second question is how is digital transformation helping the users to have their data secure because there is a lot of cross selling of data uh, which leads to uh, maybe uh, excessive credit also and then also like there is there are uh, repercussions for uh, selling of data cross selling of data so that these are my two questions thank you 
So, asking about one I could understand was regarding data uh, concerns, cross-selling of data, but I couldn't uh, actually get your first question because you were too loud actually. Uh, okay. uh, yeah. First thing was what a regulator will allow, TPA, some, you said something, first TPI, question. Uh, prepaid cards you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, prepaid, uh, prepaid payment. Okay, uh, PPIs. Right. PPIs, yeah. Right. Okay. So they were discontinued, they were based on AI models only uh, about uh, youth spending. So, okay. So I okay. don't think regulator is against uh, a model which is AI based. Uh, it is just the, uh, uh, you know, you. I, I, I don't know, you guys are in lending, so, uh, you know, lending is easy but getting money is uh, difficult, right? Uh, the only thought the lender has is, uh, you know, like he rightly said, history is something which you did that, but you know, if you want to find out the intention of the guy, maybe a AI ML will help. So, regulator is saying merge it together, but do it in a regulated way. It's not saying that you use either or, right? So, so the regulator is not against it. Uh, I mean, it's, if that's the perception, it is not that. He just wants it to be regulated. It wants a entity which is there where, which can, you know, they can pinpoint saying this is the entity which is doing it. What was happening there is any entity, everybody was going out and lending, right? So the money will go out in the market and you will not know how to get it back. A regulated entity today, I mean, that's what the sense RBI has is that they look at everything before they, uh, you know, lend out. You know, so they're not against AI. And the second you said uh, data usage on cross-sell. You're talking about the own data or you're talking about the data which is being bought and people are using on cross-sell? Okay, so, so I think that you, the, the data prevention uh, law which has come in, I think which will get in effect, uh, I think will help prevent that. Because today you're right, the data is getting sold and it's getting used. But tomorrow you will have that access, you will have that button to give access for uh, data to anybody to use it. No, uh, sorry. Uh, so the first question was, I, uh, I understand that government is not against AI. The question was, how will someone judge someone's credibility except for a credit history or a credit score? Right. Because PPI tried doing something similar uh, by looking at your transaction history or by looking at your bank balance. But uh, the regulators thought that is not the way uh, it should be used for lending. These are not the parameters. So just wanting to understand what are your views on what are other ways where personally like uh, we can make a AI model so that we can uh, get into lending. That is the point. Okay. So, <laughs> so that I think so <laughs> yeah. Super no maybe, I? May, maybe I'll make an attempt there. Uh, so in terms of alternate lending and how AI can be used, that's a it's a it's a it's a book in itself. So I'll not go there. Precisely to the question which you have, right? Uh, that he, you know, you come up with something. You're a fintech. Your DNA is to kind of experiment and try to go to new contours. Uh, that's where what Sir mentioned earlier, right? A lot more dialogue-driven engagements, conversations, SROs are actually going to be the crux of it. In the sense, like uh, we have seen how even the regulator has been supportive in terms of sandboxing, but by and large, it has been on the tech side of it. But when we are talking about product, when we are talking about new box, uh, new businesses, new models, an intermediary even like as SRO would help us to be a sandbox across the value chain, right? When we are thinking in terms of, hey, you know, whether this is possible or not, whether there is a feasibility, whether there's something of a different viewpoint. Currently, we operated a little more in a binary form in the sense like maybe some models fintechs would have deployed and then there is a different inference and post facto maybe it came out as like a little bit of a jerk into the system. So not that can be avoided. Experimentation has to be there. And as was mentioned, it's not like the regulators and the ecosystem are oblivious to it. That experimentation has to happen. But the way the cushioning is going to be is in the form of a intermediary. Somewhere or the other, that applies to the other question also, which you had, the second part on the data part. The, yes, there is a data protection which is going to be the overall umbrella. But if you look at it, even in pockets, even in digital lending guideline, there has been clear, clear, precise, pretty surgical information and guidance in terms of what you can do with the data and what you cannot do. There are clear call out of purpose of the data and how you're going to use it. So it is not even left to the power of consent to the user because we know, you and I know how we do I agree. So that's where even the regulator has already come in. And as I said, in summary, an intermediary like an SRO will all the more help in terms of making sure things are a lot more dialogue driven and it's not a jerk into the system.
I think thank you so much. I think we uh, uh, are all… One more question? Okay, one last question, then we will go to the report. Uh, good afternoon, panelists. Uh, I am Shivi Goel, from, a co-founder of Lexi Pesa, an NBFC uh, in the name of Mother Installments Limited. We are based out of Meerut. Now, my question to every one of you is that uh, for people, for NBFCs like us, those who are doing the uh, physical lending in the rural part of, say, Uttarakhand and Uttar Pradesh, uh, now uh, all of a sudden there has been a, a flow of like digital lending. When we talk about inclusive lending, inclusive financial, in financial inclusion of everybody, say, rural, so we need both AI based model and also the person on the street. Now, when it comes to that, there's a lot of cost involved in both of them. Because obviously, AI or the digital part of the AI, all the data which is available, there are few, very few, but there are very few people, those who do not have any kind of credit history, we cannot judge them just by their digital applications. So we have to uh, do a physical verification for them and every all, all those kind of things. Now, when it comes to this, for NBFCs like us, we borrow at a higher rate just because uh, we are moving into the digital lending kind of model. We have a higher cost. On the other part, uh, regulatories like RBI and all the other bodies, they do not let uh, want uh, micro-enterprises for that sake to pay higher rate of interest. How this gap can be bridged for uh, NBFCs, those who have an intention to financially include the small, uh, rural part of the India, the micro-entrepreneurs, uh, with a smaller ticket size for their day-to-day -day business activities and also to uh, save the cost or to keep the cost of acquiring the client and uh, managing these clients and these rural um, in the entrepreneurs at a low cost. Sir. Yeah, so uh, you break the expense part into two two segments. One is your verification of end use and all that. So that cost will be there uh, depending on the kind of loan you're extending. Where it cuts down the cost for you is in terms of uh, transaction, the speed of transaction and the safety of money. The moment you have eliminated cash movement between the, bran between the branch and the staff and uh, the borrower and the borrower to the uh, branch, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, shaft cuts down, uh, security comes into play, it reduces your risk of, uh, you know, uh, any other incident, unforeseen in incident happening, and the money comes into your account immediately, so the liquidity management becomes faster. So those are the operational uh, benefits, the financial benefits uh, come into play in terms of reducing your uh, expenses and improving your margins. Yeah. Uh, just a small ad addition maybe, uh, the way it is, right? You're hearing, for, just to have a qualifier, you're, you're hearing for someone, from someone who is fully into tech, fully fintech, 100% DTC, 100% digital, and that's the same me who is going to also share that only digital will not work when you look at the overall uh, space. So if you take a view of like who is your target segment, and if you take a view of like what is the asset class which you are catering to, the, you will, we'll all know like there will be a journey of digital over a period of time, but the proportion between digital, physical or a digital model that will continue to be there. So the platter is not going to be only one size fits all kind of a thing. There will be difference around it. And I would like to believe the ecosystem, including the regulators, in our own personal experience, I can call it out, they have a fair view of not painting with the same brush which is the asset class, what's your serviceability, what is the fairness in terms of the cost and what therefore you are charging to the end consumer. Uh, they have the consideration, patience and understanding to look into the details. And if it is not something as an outlier based on this two, the service of your target group and therefore the cost of service and the other aspect is of the asset class, I think there is always a fair reciprocation in terms of any price point consideration. So thank you, I think uh, there's an indication uh, uh, for launch of a report, maybe we are overshooting our time. <laughs> so please, let's, we can go ahead with that.